of the Pestside Reevaluation Division. And are there seven or eight divisions? Nine. There's nine. Okay, there's more than when I used to be there. But she's one of nine people that run the Office of Pestside Programs. And so this is kind of a she's a she's a VIP. Um, and she is going to be speaking tomorrow about uh, fumigants. But while she was out here, we wanted her to, I wanted her to give another presentation. And she's, she's going to talk about pesticide registration review. And one of her responsibilities is managing the registration for existing products. Is that correct, Yuting? So all the products that, that we know is under her, her branch. And so I gave her a list of products to talk about. Um, and so we want to hear uh, how they're going to let us keep malathion and how we're going to keep vitate and all the organophosphates and carbamates and pyrethroids. Um, so anyway, we're very, very fortunate to have her. She flew all the way out from Washington, D.C. just to talk to us. So come on up, you team. So in other words, it's all Alan's fault, right? Everybody knows that, right? It's, it, it always is. That's good. So I know, um, so this crowd's familiar with Alan, but um, thank you very much for inviting me um, today to talk about the registration review program. As Alan was saying, we have nine divisions in the Office of Pesticide Programs, um, about 650 people uh, working in EPA for this program. And I have to say, I guess the registration review is not the most popular program because we're looking at the old chemistry. Sometimes there's going to be a risk that we did not address in the previous program. Um, the more popular programs are the new registration, basically. But nonetheless, I'm here to give an update on what's going on with um, EPA and how things are going with the PESI reevaluation. So I will go over just generally our framework and where things are. As Alan was saying, he gave me a list of specific active ingredients that he wanted me to cover. And then there was specific question about Section 18, emergency exemption request and the timing associated with that. So um, right off the bat, knowing that I work for the EPA, we're trying to make sure that the pesticides that are in use are safe and are available for the growers and other users. And we're trying to make the best regulatory decisions to protect public health and the environment. And there's some core principles. We want to follow sound science, um, making sure that we're making decisions based on best available data and the current science. Also, transparency to growers is very important to the registration review program and also to the regulated community, i.e. the registrants and chem chemical companies and the public. And then continue to meet the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA. So for the registration review program, which is a division that I run, um, it's really running out of the FIFRA Section 3G, which requires the EPA to review each of the registered pesticide every 15 years. So we are actually in the first round of the pesticide reevaluation program right now. It started in 2007, so we have 15 years to finish that. That means by um, October 2022, we need to finish not quite 725 cases because that includes conventional, which is what we're talking about here, in addition to antimicrobial products and also biopesticides. Someone just was talking to me about RNAi um, during the break, and that's kind of a different division, the more popular division that runs that program. Um, but that really, the 725 cases encompass over a thousand pesticide active in ingredients. So there's a lot of work. Um, and we only really have five years left to do the first round. So one thing that the pesticide reevaluation program is different from the previous um, with its predecessor, which is re-registration. Folks may be famil familiar with that, transparency being built in. There are several different deliverables, which I'll go into a little bit in the next slide. But for this slide, really the point is we start with opening the docket, letting the, everyone know that we're starting to evaluate a certain pesticide cases and basically talk about what are the data gaps and what are some of the schedule that we want to go over. That in itself has 60 day comment period. So it's open to the public, it's published on our um, 
theregulatory.gov, and people can give us comments and correct any mistakes that we have. And after that, we basically call in the data that we need um, from the registrant for them to develop the data, to submit the data. And that usually takes about three years to do that before we can take a look at the information and start developing our risk assessment. And that generally takes a little bit over a year to do that. Once the risk assessment is done, it will be published again for public comment period for another 60 days. And sometimes we get requests for an extension. So it really depends on how popular that chemical is, how many you know, interest points are out there. And then after that, we would evaluate the comments and trying to figure out if there's any mitigation that we still need to put on the label. And at this point in the proposed interim decision, we're also considering the risk and the benefit of the chemical. So it's not just one uh, piece of the equation. Risk is not the one piece. Also, we have to consider the benefit of the chemical. And then after we um, formulate this proposed interim decision with our mitigation, then that goes through its own 60-day public comment period um, before we work on the final interim decision. So really, there's three public involvement process. So we're trying to make the registration review very transparent. So this just kind of go into a little bit more detail about what I was talking about, the purpose of each of the um, the process in this flow diagram that I just showed. With the final and uh, preliminary work plan, what we're doing is trying to capture the use and usage of the pesticide, what we know about it, and what we anticipate to do in terms of risk assessment since what we have done the reevaluation or re-registration before, the data gap, and then the associated overall schedule. So you probably are wondering, so how long does this all add together from beginning to the end? generally takes five to six years for this whole process, for a chemical to go through this entire process, given all of this public comment and all the data generation by the registrant. And then we, um, the draft human health and eco risk assessment, obviously, is where we are soliciting the public comment on how we have done our risk assessment. Is there any comments about the assumptions that we've used? This is often a good time for stakeholders to provide clarification on the uses. Um, usually that when there is unclarity on the label, we tend to assume the maximum rate. So oftentimes that's where the clarification may come in is that we only use the maximum rate once a year or that we never use them. So this is a time that you will give us feedback on whether or not these label assumptions that we have used in the risk assessment is realistic. So following that is what I was mentioning about proposed interim decision. Again, it depends on what risk we're identified. If it's a risk related to food, which is that it's a commodity risk, then we do not have the luxury of benefiting uh, or uh, balancing that with a benefit. But for everything else, when it comes to the other risk, we can take a look at the benefit of the, um, the chemistry and what it means for the growers. In, and also the impact of mitigation. So we have a separate division that actually just solely dedicated to doing the benefit analysis. So after we um, publish our proposed interim decision, we also work with our stakeholders such as USDA and different grower groups come in um, to EPA and request meetings with us and talk about different chemistry that they're interested in. We also actually work with individuals who want us to have a crop tour out to their state. Um, in fact, Alan and I just talking about um, a couple of years ago, I was in Washington crop tour. Um, it was actually the Western Washington portion of it, but every year we have about a dozen different crop tours that we go to different state to hear about um, the challenge that they have and which chemistry are um, important to them and what are the benefit of them. And at this point, too, if we have revised our risk assessment because of the input that we receive on public comments, we'll also revise the risk assessment and issue that at the same time. And then after all the consideration of comments, then we issue our final decisions. So I'm just going to focus on the conventional pesticide, which in EPA land, in Office of Pesticide land, that means it's not a biopesticide, it's not an antimicrobial meaning it's not a disinfectant. So most of these conventional has a lot of ag uses. So there's 460, approximately 460 cases of pesticide that's going through the current round of registration review. 
we have completed the first step. All the preliminary work plan is done, and we are done with also the final work plan. Um, we are still issuing these data call-in. That's what DCI stand for, data call-in. This is where we issue to the chemistry company and say we need the following data to be generated. We need this kind of tox data um, for animals and this kind of eco study. So we are anticipating that we'll issue all of our data call-in by early 2018. So when I talk about the 15-year goal, uh, we have five years left, and this is what we have to do before that date is up. We have to complete 180 um, draft first assessments. So that's about, I think I calculated yesterday, 40% of the work left to do in five years. And then we have the proposed interim decision, 270 of those. That's about 60% of the work in terms of decisions that's going to come out. And then also the final decision that follows the proposal. So in other words, we have a lot of work ahead of us. So a lot of the FY18 priority for us is going to be um, some of the cases that I'm going to be talking about later, the neonics, pyrethroids, um, we're going to be issuing risk assessment on glyphosate hopefully soon. So all of these, and fumigants, so some of these work that is going to really come out in 2018. So as Alan was saying that he gave me a list of chemicals or groups of chemicals that he wants me to address, and obviously, um, if you have additional chemicals that you're interested in, we can certainly talk about that as well. Um, so starting with CAPTAN, um, the registration review began in 2013, and this is an older chemistry, um, is a fungicide that was has already gone through re-registration, which is the predecessor of reg review. And there were some uses that were voluntarily canceled by the registrant um, during that time. I think turf is one of the uses, antimicrobial is another use. So since the um, re-registration, we have been working with um, the registrants to clean up some of the labels. So a lot of times you will see that we call a label cleanup. Uh, again, if there's unclarity in the label, we want to make sure it's consistent across the product so that there's no ambiguity about how it should be applied and the use, and this will help us refine our risk assessment. Um, so, so far the team and registrant is working to clean up, um, I, what my staff is telling me is over 60 of the Section 3 labels, and there's about 10 state um, special labels that we're also working with the states to clean up. And um, I think for the, this, we talk about the comments that we received when we first opened the registration review. From the Northwest, um, they identified some tolerance issue, and also some growers gave us the comments about the importance of CAPTAN. So our expectation for CAPTAN is that for 2018, we expect to release a draft risk assessment. Basically, we have done all the data, the data have come in, we have looked at the risk assessment and we're about to issue them basically next year. And then we hope to, in the same year, maybe early in 2019, to come up with our proposed interim decision, which means if there's any risk um, that has been identified, we have evaluated the benefit associated with that chemical and then come up with any mitigation proposal. So the next chemical is Oxymel. Um, the registration review for Oxymel, which is Vide, started in September 2010. So it's a little bit later um, compared to CAPTAN. So um, the draft risk assessment actually already went out earlier this year in September 2017 and actually just closed with its November um, 2017 date. So this one also went through re-registration. Um, there were some, during the re-registration, there were already reduction in application rate. And also, um, I think for both aerial and soil application, and also reducing seasonal maximum application rate, and there was some addition of the personal protective equipment for workers. Um, there were also some voluntary cancellation of certain uses. So right now we're at that basically the, th the third stage, looking at the comments that we receive from the risk assessment and then start formulating our mitigation strategy. So we're expecting that we'll be issuing the proposed interim decision in 2018. So methylmel is uh, on the same time frame as oxymel, which started registration review in 2010. So um, we are planning to release draft risk assessment early in 2018. And 
I'm not sure if folks are familiar with Endangered Species Act that we have to comply with. So this is one of the pilot chemicals that's going through um, the ESA consultation with the services. Can certainly talk to you guys more about that if you're interested in where things are with ESA. Um, so for methamyl, also is an older chemistry um, that went through re-registration. I think in 2014, there were some voluntary cancellation due to drinking water risk. Um, and there was some reduction in application rate as well. So this one you can tell it's a little bit behind in terms of we will not be coming up with a decision until probably 2019. So malathion, I was just here listening to Alan's presentation. Um, so we actually, for this one, the registration review started in 2009. It is an organophosphate. Um, Other chemistry went through registration. We issue our draft risk assessment for human health in 2016. Um, we have received comments from Washington State. Again, emphasizing the benefit use um, of malathion for small fruits and minor crops. So for this one, which went through re-registration, um, which was completed in 2006, and it was later on revised for 2009, so there were already different things that were done in terms of mitigating the risk for malathion back in re-registration. So this one is also um, an ESA pilot chemical. The difference between malathion and methamyl is that this one actually, EPA went through its biological evaluation so the, um, the way ESA works is that EPA makes a call on the biological evaluation before we turn our document over to the services, which will be Fish and Wildlife and also uh, Marine Services. And they will then do their biological opinion on whether or not there's any um, risk to the endangered species. So we have actually completed our portion of it back in earlier this year in January and have turned this over to the services. Um, for this particular one, we're also expecting that we'll be issuing the draft um, proposed interim decision in late 2019, perhaps early 2020. So you, do you see how Alan is? He, he gave me all these hard chemicals. <laughs> all the old chemistry that people are con concerned about. So uh, uh, diazinon, another organophosphate. Um, so th this one, the registration review began in 2008, and we actually already published our human health risk assessment in 2017, and the comment period closed back in the summer 2017. Again, it's another pilot chemical for ESA, so we, that actually takes place of the ecological risk assessment that was completed in January 2017. The date is very similar to Malathion that we're expecting to have proposed interim decision in late 2019 or, or early 2020. So FOSMED. Um, FOSMED, we started the, the risk, the uh, registration review back in 2009. And Again, it's older chemistry. It has already mitigation put in place during re-registration. There were some REI that were lengthened um, and additional personal protective um, equipment to protect workers and bystanders. This one, just like diacinon, we release our human health risk assessment back in May and we close it in the end of summer. And again, the, the day is very similar to the previous two. We're expecting to pro, um, propose the interim decision in late 2019 or early 2020. So um, the next couple ones that are coming up is going to be groups of chemical. And they're actually is going to, things are really going to, um, we started to release these already. And we are expecting that for the pyrethroids, we, actually took a lot of what we learned from re-registration in terms of ecological risk assessment. So we're trying to do things also more streamlined and better faster. So we grouped 20 of the chemicals together and issue a streamlined draft risk assessment in 2016. Um, I think not surprisingly, aqu aquatic uh, risk is something that we identify in our ecological risk assessment. And the public comment closed in the summer of 2017. So Right now, um, during 2016 and 17, we start issuing individual human health risk assessment, and we're trying to finish this up um, by early 2018 to finish all of the human health. 
And we are working with the pyrethroid registrants to better refine the hazard information. So for this one, we're actually expecting to have our proposed interim decision in 2018 if we can work pretty fast. So one thing my staff wanted me to talk about is when you guys hear about these public comment period closing is kind of the scope of, you know, how, how many comments do we really receive? You know, how, how many possibly can we really receive? So for, um, for example, for the eco pyrethroid risk assessment, uh, we receive 1,400 comments on the eco risk assessment alone. So uh, with the human health, we have, you know, comments that come in as well. Obviously, a lot of the 1,000 or 400, some of them are form letters that people just mass mail us and please don't cancel this pesticide. So um, a lot of mass mailer. The, the comments that are most, um, I think, useful for us is where there's actually data information that can help us really um, distinguish one chemistry from another. What's the benefit of this chemistry? What are some of the things that, again, going back to the label clarification, are you really using that maximum rate? Is that really necessary to be on the label, et cetera? So um, always think about that when you're submitting comments is that um, just to say one thing is important, that's probably true, but it's most useful when there's data information that's backing that up. Um, so another popular groups of chemical that I can, every time I go to the conference, I can't talk, always have to talk about is the neonics. Um, so we've been working pretty hard in trying to um, be part of the pollinator protection strategy. And one of our commitment for the agency is to develop these preliminary pollinator risk assessment for the neonics. Um, so we have actually done that in 2016, released the preliminary um, pollinator risk assessment for imidacloprid, and then in 2017 for the rest of the three neonics. Um, so clothianidin, thiamethoxam, and dinotefuron. So right now, we are in the process of working on the rest of the eco-risk assessment. So there's the pollinator, and then there's the other taxa that we're trying to assess the risk to. And there's also some human health risk assessment that we're trying to finish. So um, pretty soon here, I hope we can go ahead and release these additional risk assessment for public comment. And then our plan really is to um, issue the final pollinator risk assessment as well as any proposed interim decision in middle of 2018. So for the neonics, it's slightly different that we've been working with Canada um, PMRA and also California DPR and trying to align our risk assessment since the chemistry is being used um, both countries and also California um, has its own um, sort of set of limitation that they're uh, working on. So we're trying to align that. Um, so again, giving a sense of kind of importance of this chemistry for the um, imidacloprid for the pollinator risk assessment that was released in 2016, we received 400,000 comments on that. Um, for the rest of these back three, we got uh, basically 350,000 comments. So when you kind of wonder what, what is EPA doing that has taken five, six years to do things, um, it's mainly because of the public participation process that we put in the registration review program that we obviously have to um, address the comments. And just one piece that I did not mention earlier is that we don't just kind of you know, say, we check the box and address comment. Oftentimes, with these proposed interim decision, we actually have a response to comment document that talks about all the comments that we have received, and these are our responses to comment. So you can actually find your comment and how we have addressed them. Um, so I guess some. Uh, so for Neonix, I know that it is important to um, to the berry industry. So um, the preliminary pollinator risk assessment that went out earlier this year and also in 2016 did identify that the berry crop group is one of the four crop groups of concern along with citrus, cotton, and cucurbits. So um, again, I think this is where we will have to rely heavily on the benefit of the chemical. So 
when you take a look at what we have put together, um, either the risk assessment, so whatever comments that you submit during this time, we'll basically take them all into consideration, okay? So, um, and then trying to work through all of them along with the benefit of the chemical before the proposed interim decision. So, again, kind of going back, I hate to harp on this, but there's a reason why we have so many public comment period is for people to give us feedback. So once you take a look at our proposed interim decision, you feel like we have missed something about the benefit of neonics for the buried industry, then you definitely need to let us know. Again, more supporting data information, the better. So um, there was a question about the timing of Section 18. Oh, thanks, Chris. So I'm probably the only one that he had to use that five-minute mark. No? Oh, no. Okay. So um, I think the question was, why is Section 18 recently taking so long? And uh, so I work with the registration division, and basically a lot of the recent trend of exemption that has come in are either about the new active ingredients or the chemistry that requires assessment for cumulative assessment or older chemistry, even the ones that have been canceled. So when it comes to that, we have to basically do a lot more work in trying to figure out um, if it is still safe even during exemption. And then obviously I think folks are aware that um, there's some criteria for applying for the emergency exemption. There's gotta be emergency claim on an economic loss. Um, there's dietary issues or occupational issues. So there's different criteria that has to meet. Um, so I think the bottom line here is that we strongly encourage um, the state lead agencies to come in and talk to us before um, doing a pre-consultation so we know what's coming and we understand the emergency that's involved. And then so we can kind of work with you to um, put the, you know, to help you put the package together. That's a strong package. Generally, we aim to make decision within 50 days and we working with the registration division that actually um, they show me kind of the trend of what's been happening in 2015 through 2017. They have been able to meet the, the 50 day deadline for them. Um, I think there were a couple of Section 18 requests from Washington State on Mint and other things that they were, some of them did not have enough information. So there's obviously um, case by case, but we tried to meet our 50 day um, deadline. And again, we definitely want to partner with the state lead agencies in terms of putting these emergency requests together. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Thanks. Do we have any questions? We've got a minute. Yes. So I heard your, you make the point about how important it is to include data in feedback. Yeah. So with 300,000 comments, how do you identify the, the comments that have data in them? You know, just a tip to us, do we need to put tables in there or a little sign saying, here's some data? No, actually, um, so the way the Office of uh, Pesticide Program works that we have four registration divisions, right? So we have the regular registration division and mines their evaluation. And then we have the biopest and antimicrobial. So the rest of the, the division, one actually just does human health risk assessment solely. The other one does ecological risk assessment only. And then we have a division that does benefit. So what we do, the folks in my shop, the, the chemical review managers. So each chemical review manager in my shop manage about a dozen chemicals. So what they do is they go to um, the docket and then they start pulling down all the comments and then wherever it's eco-related, they will start parsing them out to the different division. So basically that's how we do it. And then we're in this like form letter that like what I was talking about, we're just mass mailer. We're just kind of pull that out, put it separately. So you don't have to tag anything specifically. Basically we have a team of people working on separate pieces of the assessment that they are responsible for. Yeah. It's like triaging. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.